it's Neil here. I want to go over some of the questions that you're asking after last night's class. And it is about chapter seven and hedging. And we really want to focus on the first half of chapter seven. So we have someone here asks, how should we recognize accounting entries if a companies choose a mix of forward contract and option when hedging foreign exchange risk? The only way to recognize the accounting entries is to do one at a time. You have to account for differently. What we want to show you last night was that having a hedging contract, like a forward contract, is a separate contract from the original sales transaction contract or the original purchase transaction contract that gives you an accounts receivable or accounts payable in the balance sheet. So if a company has a mix of a forward contract and option, well then they're two contracts and they need to be accounted separately, just like the original sales transaction has to be accounted separately. Now to be very, very clear, we're not going through accounting for option contracts in this course. We don't have time to go into too much detail on that. At the, the basic learning objective of this chapter is to get a, some feeling of how do we account for a hedge and we're really focusing the main learning on the hedging instrument that is a forward contract how do we account for that so we're not going through how to account for options which gets much more detailed and much more complicated because of the how to value the option it goes into a totally new area so we're not covering that in this course unfortunately uh, next question, normally profit and loss generated from a hedging account for how much normally profit or loss generating from hedging can account for how much portion of the total comprehensive income? Well, if there's, if all of the income is from overseas, then it may represent a huge portion of the total comprehensive income. So. Uh, I don't have any figures of what's normal. Uh, Apple released in their latest quarterly earnings statement showed for the last 12 months that they had a huge gain on their forward contract hedging, which actually hedged their sales in foreign currency. And as you know, in the last 12 months, foreign currency has gone down against the US dollar big time, the most in the last five years. And, but that was only a small proportion. They could have hedged even much more. I think it was less than 30 or 25% of the total income they got from overseas. So it was only a small portion. They could have hedged even more, but they didn't. So I don't have the figures of what's normal, but it, it can be a total variation from zero to uh, over 50%. Our next question from UN, why hedge accounting results in a discount expense, especially does, and you've got PowerPoint 7.41. We can bring that up here. Where is 7.41? We'll go through to that now. Okay, so we've got a discount expense here, and you're probably thinking, well, what is this 1667? Okay, a discount expense is we are allocating a portion of the initial cost of the hedging contract because the you weren't able to hedge at uh, the US dollar to peso point one one you can only hedge at US dollar to peso of 105 okay so immediately off the bat right from the beginning in this example for 1 million pesos we are losing 5,000 US dollars it's a three month contract so therefore under fair value accounting well, this is under a cash flow accounting. We're able to actually write off one third of that cost of that forward contract and we put it as a discount expense. Then that goes into the income statement. And so that affects the cash flow of the company because at the end of the three months, you're going to have a total effect on cash flow of $5,000 no matter whether the foreign exchange goes up or down because you weren't able to hedge perfectly. In other words, the three month forward rate was a 
5,000 US dollar discount to the current spot rate when you initiated the hedge. So that's what we mean by discount expense. In some ways, it's more of an amortization expense, like depreciation expense. But we're not dealing with machinery, we're dealing with the forward contract. And now we, uh, so Jesse asks, do firms, ma do firms do hedge accounting on exact the transaction date? Ideally, that's when you should initiate forward contracts on the transaction date. Why? Because it's likely you'll get the best deal in terms of a forward rate. If it starts working against you, the forward rate at that three month period also starts to move. And so you can actually lose the opportunity to hedge at the best rate that is closest to the spot rate on the date of the initial contract. Mm. So let's have a look at Yeezy asks a question. Why should we discount the cost of the option? Okay, we're not going into detail of the options, but whether you have a forward contract or an option, initially, when you start that contract, it has a cost. And so we need to amortize that cost over the period of the hedging instrument. If it's three months, then we need to one third each month. If the reporting date is one third into a three month period, then we're going to have some kind of a discount expense. We're going to have some kind of option fee that we need to amortize. Uh, Zhao Jun asks a question, when is the journal entry of the option premium when the company pay for that? Okay, we're not going into accounting for options as it, it goes into much, much more detail than what you need to know for a basic forward accounting for forward contract. Uh, Lee Chung asks a question, why do we not mention about procedure of a fair value hedge method? Ah, so we spent a lot of time on the cash flow method yesterday. With the fair value method, we are not interested in accounting for that cost of the hedge, you know, that $5,000 that under cash flow accounting, we had one third at reporting date, then two thirds at the end of the at the end of the contract period. Under fair value accounting, we do not create a discount expense for that one third at the reporting date. We actually expense all of it at the end. So under fair value accounting, we're not trying to reflect the cash flow effects on the income statement. We and and the fairness of that cash flow effect over time. Under fair value accounting, we do not reflect that cost until the end of the period of the contract. So we don't have to worry about amortizing any discount expense any any gap between the spot rate and forward rate when you initiated a hedging instrument. So that's the big difference with their fair value hedge method. Okay, and the other big difference is that we are moving all losses or gains at the reporting date and at the end date into the income statement. As you know, under IFRS, there are limits to a, the extent that you can do that. And so IFRS and companies are kind of on the same side here in preferring to use the cash flow method. That is, we separate out the gains or losses, we put it into an asset or liability under comprehensive income. We create an asset or liability and that is the forward contract gain or loss. That becomes an asset or liability that is offsetting any partial gain or loss that's in accounts receivable or accounts payable at any reporting date during the contracting period. All right, so we're using other comprehensive income to balance out that and adjust the shareholders' equity. So we're not adjusting the income of the company mid-period. We're only reflecting any gains or losses only at the end of the contract period under fair value accounting. So therefore we don't need to, number one, amortize the cost of the hedge. We don't need to create an other comprehensive income 
account to put gains or losses into to keep them from the income statement affected gains or losses. We don't need to separate that out. The gains or losses all go into one area under fair value accounting. Under cash flow, we separate and companies like that separation because they have a little bit more control over their pure income statement and what that reflects about the company's operations. Okay, what else have we got here? Let's have a look at something else. Could you explain more about when to make an entry into net income and when to make an entry into other comprehensive income under cash flow accounting? Okay, so we can explain a little bit more on that. Actually, if when you go to here, if you notice here, uh, I'm just drawing this. You can see this on the PowerPoint in front of you. Notice that we are creating another comprehensive income amount. What we are doing is we're just preserving an asset or liability in terms of create. We're creating a gain on the forward contract, but we need to have an offsetting debit or credit, right? It's all balancing everything. And so that offsetting debit or credit is accumulated other comprehensive income, which will be part of the shareholders' equity. It's sort of like a retained earnings part in the balance sheet. Okay, the foreign exchange loss of 10,000 is offset by the gain on forward contract. Great. Okay, so that offsets that, so there's no change in income statement. However, the accounts receivable goes down 10,000, so that means our assets have gone down 10,000. And now we create an accumulated other comprehensive income, which is an equivalent asset, 10,000. So we, to make sure that the balance sheet still shows assets of 10,000, uh, they've gone 10,000 in accounts receivable have gone down by 10,000, but an asset called accumulated other comprehensive income has gone up by 10,000. And so then we net that off against the forward contract and the forward contract becomes the asset in the balance sheet that we see. We see a forward contract only 8911 and accumulated other comprehensive income is netted off the accumulated, accumulated other comprehensive income. Why? Because it's a discounted fair value of the forward contract. So the new this reduction in accounts receivable of 10,000 gets kind of offset by a forward contract asset of 8911. That offsets that. So now the balance sheet has accounts receivable that's less than 10,000, but now it has a new asset called forward contract 8911. By the end of the date, the forward contract should be valued at 10,000. So at the moment, you're only carrying it at 8911. Now you need to net it up to its real value, realized value at the end of the three month period. So we'll do that at the end of the three month period. But until we get there, we are only you, we are only creating an asset for the time value of money discounted value of that end value. You with me? So the 8911 is a discount value of that 10,000. Um, in three months time, we will make it 10,000. But one month into that contract, it can only be valued at 8911. I think what's important is to really focus on number one, uh, cash flow accounting. So cash flow accounting, we're recognizing the cost of the forward contract and hedging. Number two, we are at any reporting date that's in between the contract period and the cash flow accounting, we are going to offset, but not anymore, offset to the extent of any loss on accounts receivable, accounts payable, but we can't offset more than that, okay? And what we are doing is creating a an alternative asset or liability to make up for that gain or loss of accounts receivable, accounts payable. And that alternative asset or liability is the forward contract, whether it is a forward contract with a loss in it or forward contract with a gain in it. It's going to be opposite to what happened to the accounts payable or accounts receivable. And that's what we're trying to do. We're just hedging. And the accounts receivable goes down, then we create a forward contract that goes up by the same amount. 
but the only difference is that it can it can't go up any further but we will discount it for the fair value of the hedge and any difference will go into uh, accumulated other comprehensive income so that's that's what we're doing with cash flow accounting we're trying to recognize the real cash flow effect on the income statement and until the end of the three month period there is not a big effect of the cash flows on the income statement so that's why we have to do all these other adjustments we're actually creating new accounts in the balance sheet not the income statement where we're creating a forward contract in the balance sheet as a liability or an asset depending if it has a loss or a gain in it and any difference is going into accumulated other comprehensive income so we're trying to keep that separate from the income statement so under cash flow accounting the income statement should properly reflect the real cash flows of the organization so the only other cash flow effect on the income statement is the actual partial expense of the forward contract and so those two things they are the two big differences under cash flow accounting that do not exist under fair value accounting I've got many more questions from you and I'll try and go through more of them in detail uh, I urge you to go over the example in the book that we didn't cover in the lecture so we can uh, better understand especially the cash flow hedge accounting and not to go into too much detail on the accounting for options and further parts of the book that's certainly you know very very well one area and so then we can make greater progress through other chapters in this course thank you for watching and i'll pick you up in other questions that other classmates have actually asked thank you bye for now